Hello and welcome to Two Guys on Two Coasts. He's Clint and I'm Phil. Thanks for hanging out with us. We have a guest. Clint, what do we say about the conversation with you and Fred? Wow. <laughs> wow. It was a 2-0 changeup. I didn't see it coming. <laughs> Not really, but kind of. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, Jackie Robinson, his impact on you, on me, on uh, the sport that we both love, baseball, and on our culture, because Jackie Robinson deserves that, and Jackie Robinson has impacted our culture. If I were to pick the four most important people in the United States the last century, Jackie Robinson would probably have to be the first, because uh, most people think of how Martin Luther King Jr. impacted Jack. It's actually the opposite. He was a decade before MLK, and uh, Martin has often said that he drew a great deal of inspiration from Jackie first uh, when he was still a teenager. So uh, let's talk about where in the number 42, Jackie Robinson in culture, baseball, and in our lives. Go ahead. Well, I'm so I'm I'm so under. I mean, I, I'm not, I think we're an expert to speak on Jackie. However, what his impact has had on the African-American players that I've had. Mm. Um, when I think back really in Pittsburgh, Josh Harrison, Andrew McCutcheon, um, Latroy Hawkins in Colorado, um, just to name three quickly. But the impact of his service his, you know, if you flip like you flip over a ball card and you see the, the record of service, if you had the ball card for his life, you flip it over that record of service. I was listening in the Isotopes ball game yesterday that our our radio announcer um, actually gave me information on Jackie I didn't have and told me the trials and tribulations, the time in between, the not all the other sports besides besides baseball, but then the work stoppage and, and all the other stuff that he's had to overcome. And I was listening, watching a baseball game and getting a history lesson on Jackie Robinson in the back. And it made me go home to the hotel last night before I flew into Spokane today. And I, I read everything I could that I hadn't read before. But I grabbed a quote last night that I had never read. And you can say what you want about the Internet. You know, it, it, hunt good, find good, hunt bad, find bad. I found some good last night. I found some gold. But this quote, and I shared it today, was, in Jackie's words, today, Negroes play on every big league club and in every minor league. With millions of other Negroes in other walks of life, we are willing to stand up and be counted for what we believe in. In baseball or out, we are no longer willing to wait until judgment day for equality. We, we want it here on earth as well as in heaven. I get goosebumps again when I read it. How impactful that man's mind, as well as his heart, his courage, everything else. Um, that quote right there, that one will never leave me. I mean, equality until judgment day. You know, we want it here now. That's not just waiting till we get to heaven. Yeah. I've studied Jackie for a long time. Uh, my wife and we live, uh, my wife attended the same high school. I got to show you this. I'm wearing it. John Muir High School is uh, John Muir Mustangs, Jackie Robinson High School is where my wife attended. And uh, it impacts uh, that, of course, and living in Pasadena, where he was not treated well as a young man. His family uh, traveled from uh, George Rule, Cairo, Georgia, to live in Pasadena. He was not treated well. His brother, Mac, an Olympic hero, worked at school where... Uh, he attended and where my, my wife attended and, and my wife knew him. My wife is uh, African-American, white and Native Indian American. Uh, my son played pro baseball and he was always considered a black player. <laughs> Even, Go figure. You know, right. Uh, all of those things. And, and very I'm, white Phil is his dad. Right. And uh, all of those things. And I've studied <laughs> and researched um, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King as well. And with with Jackie and with Martin, both uh, absolutely ground uh, uh, earth shaking wives, Rachel, 
and what she's accomplished in the 50 years since Jack passed away. And uh, the same thing, Corey, Coretta, and what she accomplished immediately after Martin was assassinated. Um, Jackie has impacted our culture. He's touched a lot of people that are important to me and you. Uh, when he was playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers, the deaf community adopted him because he meant something to them. Carl Erskine, one of Jackie's teammates, when he retired, moved back to Anderson, Indiana. Carl had a special needs son and started um, Indiana uh, Special Olympics. And in one of the first fundraisers, Jackie made the trip from his home in Connecticut back to Indiana to help Carl get that started. And uh, they were obviously very close. And, and Carl has remarked oftentimes at the parallels in what he saw Jackie endure and what he's seen families endure with going on, getting laws changed to make things better for families that have special needs kids, which touches your life, my brother. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the networking that's come from Jackie's stance and perseverance and courage. And who better to walk side by side at times was than Pee Wee Reese? Oh gosh. You no, know, and, and I think one of the comments I read was maybe someday we'll all wear 42 so they can't tell us apart. <laughs> I mean, how good is that? All right, now before we get to our guest, got to uh, hear from you about uh, the big event you had in Tampa for Prater Willie Syndrome and how Maddie's doing. Give us a quick update on the success of that uh, big event. 10th annual anniversary of the Clint Hurdle Hot Stove Fundraiser in support of Prader Willie Syndrome. Um, we had maybe our best event. Uh, it was a new venue. The Bradenton Country Club reached out and hugged us, Phil. They wanted to be a part of this. They were proud to be our host and have the opportunity uh, and 10 years in, we got a new band. We did some different things. We had 200 people show up. The music was great. We also had a keynote, a five-minute keynote from one of our Prader Willie young adults, a girl named Justice, that she stood up at the podium and she spoke. And one of the things that grabbed my heart and soul was, I want to say six years ago, her and Maddie were, were 15, and they were very similar in most areas. 15 going on 16, but going to be 12 in a lot of areas most of their life. Justice has catapulted into a sphere above where Maddie is. Maddie's a higher functioning proud or really uh, young adult. Justice has taken it to another level. She spoke at Washington. She spoke in the Senate. Um, she's very capable. You can still see some things, you know, that go on that confuse her or she gets a little nervous with, but the steps that she's taken, the progress our entire association has gone through over the years, the way we've been able to help so many families and support so many you know families that don't have the funds that we do to do good things but we also did something that i had to ask for forgiveness on later on the wonderful ladies that run the program with us leaving legacies foundation maddie's a big bingo player and we've been playing bingo down at the the club on key royale for about two years maddie's never won and it got to a point where it became a little contentious so I try and have fun with it. And I say, well, you know, honey, biblically, you know, Jesus got mad. He started flipping tables. <laughs> and, you know, Maddie has no filter. So one night it came out. If I don't win soon, I'm going to be flipping tables. <laughs> of course, Carla's got me by the ear, dragging me out the door. I'm trying to grab my daughter on the way. Anyway, she happened to win her first bingo game at another place at the center. And it was like, I mean, it was a walk-off. It was Bill Mazeroski's walk-off homer. For Maddie and the people around her, but we'd already set up. We rigged a bingo game for the hot stove fundraiser. Halfway through it, because everybody's playing. There's 200 people on tap playing. Halfway through it, I'm hearing some guns. Hey, wait a minute. Your card looks like my card. Wait a minute. How come we're not getting any numbers? Rawr, 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 rawr. <laughs> Maddie wins bingo, throws her hands up. Bingo! Everybody screams. There's a big prize package that comes out. So I got to get up and out. And when I when I speak, I said, for all the mumbling I heard in the background, you guys want to talk about the bingo game, I'll meet you out in the parking lot in five minutes. <laughs> we were blessed. God blessed uh, us humbly, uh, financially. And the part I like best about the way we do things, and I know we're not the only ones. Yeah. You know, fundraising is hard. Yeah. And, and people that tell me they love fundraising, I go, God bless you. You're different. You know, because I don't love it. And then there's points when it just gets hard. 
and you know you're stalking and you know people are going, oh, it's hurdle again. Oh, can this guy just let me? So the fundraising part, I, I you know, yeah, I'm relentless early. But once we get everybody in the tent, it's a party and it's a celebration. It's just yeah. fun the rest of the evening. And we were able to pull that off again in spectacular fashion. Well, I know, uh, and this is our first opportunity to catch up about it because you've been so busy with that and I've, I've had my thing. Let's take a break now. We're going to introduce a conversation with our first guest on our Two Guys, Two Coast podcast. He is Fred Stoker, uh, co-author of the uh, best-selling book, Every Man's Battle, a series of books, sold over a million copies, 30 different languages, and his recent book is Battle On, Battle Over. Here's our conversation. Joining us now is our guest, Fred Stoker, from his home in Des Moines. Fred, thanks for hanging out with us. Well, Fred, it's nice to meet you virtually. I guess my first curiosity, when you come up with your facts, because to be an expert, you've done some work. You've done some research. Obviously, this is a field that the only research I've done is through my my growing up and my living. Right. And, and my discovery or my inquisitive nature as a kid. Um, and I think it's one road that every kid travels on, you know, when you start talking about sex or you start talking, you see attractive women or, yeah. or what gets your attention. But how do you all, or you in particular, how do you grab these numbers? How do these, these numbers pull the data that you're able to pull? That's my, when you can say approximately 63% of men and 55% of women watch porn regularly, how are those numbers pulled? Honestly, um, I'm not the one that pulls those numbers. I mean, right. there, there I are companies like, uh, you know, George Barna and uh, Focus on the Family that do those kinds of surveys. Um, I personally, I do most of my research reading scientists, uh, you know, about how the brain reacts to porn and some of that sort of a thing, because, you know, I had a really strong uh problem with this and there was a time where i would have done anything read anything to get free and it just stayed a really interesting thing to me because i knew i'd have to one day help my kids stay free so um i just find those books on the brain on our sexuality to be very fascinating well no that's very cool because they are fascinating because you know in complete transparency not I can tell you that, yeah, I've looked at porn and I've gotten to a place where, first of all, I'm a man of addiction. So anything I pick up and stay with, it's got a good chance of latching on. <laughs> um, I've got multiple, I, I've had multiple challenges with, with addictions. And I mean, from anything from buying a shirt, like the shirt you have on, if I like that shirt, I'm going to go buy five of them just in different colors. <laughs> um well, but you I can find have it, this one if you want. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to fit. Maybe I don't know what. <laughs> anyway, I find it interesting because, in complete transparency, I don't know. You know, I, I have some history in masturbation. I have some history yes. of looking at porn. I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and and and, and you know sh throw shade. Um, so I do get it, and I do know how I felt when the first time I picked up a Playboy magazine and started leafing through it. And of course, that was good for a while, and then. Oh my gosh, there's a magazine called Penthouse. No, well, yes. ra that ratchets it up a little bit more. I mean, yes. and then you just continue to ratchet up till you can get you can get yourself into places that I mean, actually, where you got to look away. Oh um, well, yeah, and actually, with streaming porn now, Clint, you can actually get yourself into places where you're looking at things that you would have never conceived of on your own had that not been put before your face. I mean, some of these things are so gross uh, and so far outside really what I would consider to be normal human experience that people are seeing things that no one's ever really seen. I love the name of the book. I mean, Every Man's Battle and yeah. the series of them. I mean, that's, I mean, it's, it's spot on. Um, and today, I can't imagine, because you know what? Back in the day, for me right now, the one thing we are dealing with in sport, and the young, I work with young people now as, as well. Yes. You know, our young players in rookie ball, it can, they can be from 18 to 25 in the minor leagues. Most of them are in that in the age group. And porn, there's no doubt. But the other one's gambling. And I'm not trying to take us uh -huh. off court, but I do believe those two right now 
are the biggest crushers of young males that are that are out there, you know, because there's not a game you can't bet on. I know high school kids at some of the places I go to, some of the coaches call me, they've caught them on their phones betting on the games, betting on other games. And then the porn thing, oh, it's it's one click, it's here, or you can get click baited, you can get yeah. somewhat fooled into grabbing something and getting onto it. And it's kind of funny because you know, I used to say I'd be the guy that got fooled, but then I'd be fooled for about five minutes before I decided it wasn't good to be fooled anymore. Right, right. No, I agree with that. And and actually gambling, uh, it's funny that you say that because I was just reading an article tonight about Caitlin Clark and the ability to bet on her and her future. So, I mean, I can bet on whether she's going to have average 21 points a game next year. I can bet on how many three-point uh, shots she's going to make next year. And I'm just, just look at this and I go, who bets on this stuff? I mean, you're going to be sure to go broke. Uh, no one could possibly know those things. And But the thing about it, Clint, is that the same dopamine release, the same kind of chemistry that comes through this kind of addiction is the kind we're talking about uh, with porn and masturbation. And so uh, addictions are pretty consistent in what they do in the brain. And uh, really all of them, uh, a person needs to dump them out of their life. Or you, you never get to the point where you're living a life of full integrity and you never get to the point where you're, um, what would you say, your faith is fully mature. And uh, what I found once I got loose from the sexual sin, I was able to really have my uh, faith and my spiritual strength take leaps forward uh, into places I never thought I would be because uh, I always thought I was kind of a loser uh, because of that, what I call the perversion with my sexual right. sin. And um, once I got out of that, I realized I wasn't a loser at all. Right. No, we're all saved by grace and we're all, yeah, we're, we all come short in so many different areas. Yep. Um, and then in my own life, I'm on the side now where I've battled through addiction. Uh, Phil may or may not have told you my story, but I'm a recovering alcoholic. And when you say I can relate those feelings of, okay, I'm not going to do it today. And then after I've done it, going, what just happened? I did it again. Yes. You know, there, there I am. Or and, have I ever lived that? Yes. And it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't the first thing I thought about when I got up in my, in the morning, but it popped into my head at some time in the morning. And then okay. you keep playing this game with yourself. No, I got this. I got this. No, it's no, no, I still got it. I'm halfway through the day. And then by five o'clock I'm going, God, I'm a mess. Look at this. But, you know, but, but today's, you know, you used to have to sneak around to get porn. You know, at least back when I was a kid, you had to sneak around. And then when you, when you got it, you had to hide it. Um, and now you may have to sneak around. I, I don't know. Do you sneak around on your phone? Not really. I mean, it's just boom, boom. And you're right there. And it's stuff that I couldn't imagine looking at when I was 12 or 13, but it's there. It's available. And I know it's real because as, as rough as I've, you know, things I put myself through two two divorces, you know, an alcohol addiction. Um, I've caused a lot of collateral damage in the last 10 years. I've had close to, probably 10 guys reached out to me with this exact challenge right here, porn addiction. And I usually tell them, I, you know, I can't, I understand. First of all, I, I, I can em empathize to some degree, but I can't take you probably help you the places you need to be helped. But I can tell you what got me hooked, what caught me, what helped me get away, how I stay away. But the addiction part of it, as you said, it is so networked. I mean, it was a 12-step program for me, and I've talked to this guys, and once they get the counseling or they go where they need to go, it's a very similar step process that they've got to have a check and balance system. They've got to have accountability partners. They get to the point where they've got to come clean. There was a day when I wouldn't throw my phone to you and let you look at my phone. You know, and now, you know, my wife has my phone. My daughter has my phone. It's taken a long time, but I'm finally in that place where you can call free yeah, how did yeah. how did you find what was the first time? Did you have a bottom? And when you hit that bottom, like yes. wh where did you go? Well, it's it's a little hard to talk about it, but I mean it's um because you know you're gonna get emotional when you, you think back to that moment. And you know, I had been 
there were there were like four or five things that happened boom 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 uh that got my attention number one is the holy spirit was really getting after me on a couple of verses number one was job 31 1 and uh that verse says i have made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl well and the thing is if you go into job 31 7 which is seven or eight verses later uh it's very clear that he kept that promise and and when I would read that verse, I'd go, what in the world? How did he do that? And what's a covenant with the eyes? The other verse, which is even worse, went, was uh, Luke 6, 46. And, and that's where the Lord says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? And oh, my word. I mean, yeah. I would get chased by that in my mind constantly. And anyway, so the Lord was working to get my attention but then there was a moment uh, where I was driving down Merle Hay Road in Des Moines and a, a couple other things had happened. And I had kind of said to myself, I've got to I've quit this. I've got to quit this. You know, this is going to change my life if I just quit this. Well, then I, I looked at this jogger going by and um, boy, she didn't have much on and boy, did she look good. And I lusted in my mind. And then I just burst into tears. I slammed my fist into the steering wheel and I just started screaming, not not like a guy that's scared, but I'm going to win uh, kind of a thing. And I just slammed my fist in the steering wheel and said, I can't live like this anymore. I won't live like this anymore. I'm going to figure out how to make that covenant with my eyes and I'm going to win if I die trying. Well, it was just that moment. I mean, Clint, I had tried to quit many times even before i was saved even back at stanford i was mm -hmm. i was hooked but at that moment i had fully engaged for the first time and the great thing about that clint is that when you fully engage that's when the holy spirit can really come into your life and begin to reveal to you what you need to do and it it wasn't very long before he began teaching me the steps i had to take and all of those steps are very practical. They're not, you know, woo or right. mystical. Um, all you have to do is go into my book, Every Man's Battle. And by the time you close the cover, you'll know what to do. <laughs> and that's the important thing. Well, God, praise God. And, and I'm so happy that you found that freedom because. Oh, yeah. That old saying, what, the smallest package in the world is a man wrapped up, up in himself. And then on top of that, what we're wrapped up in. Yes. Because like, and you know. I don't I don't know if you know a guy named Ryan Pineda, but I was talking to him uh, the other day and, and you know, I had just mentioned the phrase uh, having sex with myself, which is another term I use for masturbation. And he just looked at me and he said, man, that sounds awful when you think about it in those terms to have sex with yourself. Now, he wasn't saying that he had done anything or anything like right. that when he said that he was just going gosh that's that's gross and <clears throat> when you think back into your life and you think back i mean i have i mean if you read my books you know i pretty much am an open book but i gotta tell you there's probably two percent i haven't put in there because it's so <laughs> embarrassing to me uh sure. i can't even stand to write it down let alone let you read it right 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 and god knows it yeah, yeah, yeah and that's knows. the other thing is we walk through these muddy water and the ditches we get ourselves and we don't and then we try and hide them from everybody else yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. he's just looking there's, at us going really 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 yeah there's no bush big enough to hide behind on some of that stuff no. it's i'm just grateful for grace you know and the forgiveness is there and i once you get free that's the real beautiful thing because then god can promote you into new things i mean nobody ever thought fred stoker was going to be an author i mean that just wasn't out there in anybody's thoughts and yet here i am with four best sellers uh one that's a million seller it's just crazy but yeah. once he gets hold of your life in the sense that you've surrendered and just said look I don't have to have all these other things. I just need you. Well, then you get to the point where uh, he's got you where he wants you, and, and you're actually a servant and not just someone who's trying to look for good things from him. All right, well, now, guys, I'm, go I'm weighing in here. So I'm going to set up a scenario. Okay. Now, Fred, Clint is a coach who coaches coaches. 
at yeah, all I, levels. That's, I think that's an amazing job to have, Clint. Way to go. And now <laughs> you're going to coach the coach who coaches coaches on the next time someone he's traveling and someone in the baseball industry says, I, I'm, I'm sick of myself. I'm fed up. I need some simple advice. Please help. Don't tell anyone, but I need something from you cool. right yeah. now. Fred, what's he say? Well, what, first of all, let me just show you this book, Clint, because I don't know if you've seen this one. You've seen Every Man's Battle, but this is my latest book. It's called Battle On, Battle Over. And what I discovered in my own battle, Clint, was that uh, there are actually a lot of sexual things that drive sexual sin, like right, porn, streaming porn, all that a girl walking by in the string bikini, all those things, okay? But there are a number of things that literally drive sexual sin that are non-sexual. And that's where guys really get trapped, especially baseball players. I've, I've talked to a number of minor league baseball players about this very thing. And, and this is what I asked them. I said, okay, I'll tell them, okay, some triggers of sexual sin are actually non-sexual and i'll explain a little bit about it and then i will say to them okay what was it like because one of them was a pitcher what was it like when you would go out and get shelled for you know eight runs in three innings and what was it like to go back to your hotel room that night well what he said was you know you just feel like the biggest loser you think you might be losing your career um you you feel like you don't even want to face the next day. And I would say, okay, what would you do then? And he would say, in invariably, I would masturbate. And the thing is, <clears throat> when you masturbate, that brings a, a medication that soothes that wound, that stress, that pain. And what, what a coach has to do for someone like that who has come to him and said, hey, what do I do? Um, the first thing, of course, is they've got to get educated. So they read a book like Battle on Battle Over so they can understand how non-sexual uh, triggers can create the sexual sin because most guys don't make that connection and it's foggy to them. But once they understand that, then they are free because those non-sexual triggers cannot trip them up again. I was talking to a guy about that once and he said, you know, Fred, once you told me about non-sexual triggers, um, it has completely taken the fear out of my heart when it comes to my sexual sin, because now when I have a lot of stress at work and I feel these sexual cravings, I just say to myself, those aren't even sexual cravings. Those are non-sexual triggers. I don't have to do this. And he can turn away so easily. Uh, I've I've talked to players that are just you know they might have a couple of errors in a game that just kind of blow the game wide open for their teammates and lose and it's that same sort of thing so what what i've always taught for instance my sons uh from very early on that you know they need to understand that they need to take that pain that stress those wounds to the lord instead of to porn uh, where they can get medication. This is fascinating. Have, have you ever heard any of your players talk about that, Clint, where they feel like the big, the time where they, it's the biggest weakness for them is after they've had a rotten game, not a good one, for instance? Oh, yes, I've got one player that's it's ongoing, and I've got a former player, very good friend, that's ongoing. Um, what are the non-sexual triggers? I'm fascinated. I don't want you to, to give away, you know, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I'm happy to share some. Uh, I mean, I'm going to buy the I'm going to buy the books. This is yeah, this is the, fascinating. The is, yeah, at, by the time you're done through the first two chapters, you'll you'll know it inside and out. But for instance, um, father wounds. Okay, uh, my dad was a very rough guy towards me. He he was a national champion and uh, a AAU heavyweight champion wrestler. Okay, wow. and he always wanted me to be a wrestler. And about ninth grade, I quit. Uh, I just wanted to play football and baseball. Well, he never forgave me. And he never said, 
he loved me. He never said, you're a man, Fred, you belong here in this world, a man shoulder to shoulder. And that used to really uh, crush me. And I would use, uh, and then he would come to not just my games, my practices and just any mistake I made rip me up. And uh, until my, my teammates hated his guts. But the thing is, is that that created a lot of woundedness in me, a lot of shame in me that I would use to medicate. <laughs> and I never put those two together. Um, then another one would be financial stress. This is very common uh, where, uh, you know, back then when I was a young father and, you know, I had a couple of kids and I was in full commission sales and I was trying to just trying to make it in the world of men and, you know, I was having trouble making ends meet. Full commission sales is not for the faint hearted. And what happened was when I really began to look at my life, I realized that I was tended to be still masturbating on the nights where my fa financial stress was the worst. And um, so what I began to do is take that to the Lord in prayer and turn my business and finances over to him. And it began to uh, weaken that uh, very quickly. And the thing is, is that when I was feeling just like, I'm no good, I'm a loser, I can't, I'm not much of a man, that's again when I would masturbate. Because Clint, when you really look at what an orgasm does in a man's heart, it actually literally provides the feeling of false intimacy and and false connection. But it it's it's a it's a genuine draw to a guy who feels lonely, disconnected, in pain, and so an orgasm can really be a draw when a guy is feeling worse about himself. And so, but if you think about it you know, financial stress, there's nothing sexual about that, right? I oh. mean, it's, it's not a sexual trigger. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And there's so much commonality, you know, with the addictive, the oh, addictive yeah. of, of what happens. I and, would be fascinated, Clint, after you read the first couple chapters of Battle on Battle Over, I would be fascinated to have another conversation with you because I'd like to see how you would compare your alcoholism with this addiction, and I'll bet you there's a ton of non-sexual triggers when it comes to alcoholism as well. Yeah, there are, there are, and it most it becomes down to you know the the, the challenge I would always have, um, in any of the things that you know, especially with the, well with my alcohol addiction, I felt less than, and I compare, you know, and if I didn't win the game on the field, I needed to win the game after the game, you know, yes. uh, there, I had to find a win somewhere. And it's so sad that the wind would come down to, you know, getting hammered or, or you know, in the case of or, or watching porn or, you know, for those people that want to grab a drug to medicate to numb themselves temporarily because there is a temporary satisfaction. Okay, you don't feel all that angst, you don't feel the anxiety, you don't feel the loser mentality until it wears off and you're right back where you started from, but worse. For me, you know, that I couldn't have said it better myself. That's that was really good, Clint. And that is the basis of the, the non sexual um, trigger. Uh, and, and the way you said it, you're looking for a win. You had the loss in the day. Now you're looking for a win, something to make you feel good about yourself. And I really do feel like that's the that's the concept behind it. And uh, I didn't figure I would talk about it for very long before you knew exactly what I was talking about. Yeah, I just this is, this is crazy. And it's I so was just cool using different words, right? We no, we are. And the, yeah. the crazy part of it, it's a God wink as well, because God through Phil connected us. Yes, that this master plan that God's put in His lap for a while. There's no doubt. I've been reading from Nancy. He's been, you know, the things he's been sending out. I knew he set me up. I knew. <laughs> I knew he had an ambush here somewhere. Yes. And the last thing I thought I would be talking about this afternoon in Spokane, Washington, was masturbation and porn yes. with an expert. And I can't wait to call my wife tomorrow and say, honey, I did what a podcast. And she'll say, okay, we ball player did you talk to? And I go, ha ha. That's what I got <laughs> me today. Wow. today. Look, don't hurt me. Don't hurt yeah, me. No, you know, please, don't. You just... <laughs> You just tell her Fred Stoker, the ball player, because I, I did used to play ball and you can kind of squeak out of it. But, uh, but look, it makes us 
character. It, it makes us a better husband. It makes us a better father. It makes oh, us a better does. friend. It gives us the, another opportunity to be the best version of ourselves. Oh, my yes. wife, my wife knows my warts. And, and she knows all the warts. You know, it'd be like me telling her, well, I never went to a strip club. And she's just looking at me like, really? It really? Um, you know, no, I never masturbated to porn. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> um, I like your wife already. She is. She, she's, she's something. But I mean, but this is making me grow. Another thing. One of my words, two years ago, I pick a word every year. And instead of resolutions, I grab a word. Okay. And, Two years ago, my word was grow. I didn't want to let the old man in. Uh, I watched the movie The Mule. I listened to Toby Keith's song. I've got a 19-year-old son now who was younger at that time. A 21-year-old special needs daughter. I've got an older daughter that moved back home from Texas to get close to my mom and dad. There's so many cataclysmic things that were cool working on in my, in my life. However, I was 65 and out of ball for three years. Yes, I'm back in a little bit, but it's different. I didn't want to just settle. And yes. I think my wife has pushed me, but my son pushed me and my word was grow. And I look back now two years ago from writing grow on a ball to where what's happened in the last year and a half, you know, all the things I've walked through having this conversation, I'm on the brink on the edges. I'm writing, I'm writing a book right now at my Good age, you. the first yeah. time. I, yeah. It's exciting, but yeah, I found is. a different I found different ways to get the excitement that I used to seek through all the other ways. All exactly. the old, no, all that's, the old. That's what, listen, Clint, that's what men do. I mean, once you rise up and you get rid of all that junk, then you can truly be a man and fight the great battles and live the great adventures. That's what you're doing. And isn't it great to really find out what the definition of manhood is? Because oh, yeah. I, I, you know, I had other people's, I had my own, I had, you know, who I, guys, I thought I was cool. And really, I got I've gotten to a better place as a manager. But I can remember early in my managerial career in Pittsburgh, we brought in Joe Airman, who wrote the book Inside Out Coaching, which talks about masculinity and toxic masculinity. And it was the first time he peeled back some layers for me that I was like, "Oh my, I did that! No, oh my gosh, yeah, that happened to me." Or yeah. maybe some actions that I had, you know, could have put another player or coach in a, in a awkward or difficult position and then just growing up to be a man what yes. it means biblically to be a man what it means biblically to be the husband what it means biblically to be the the, the father and, and the friend and yeah. I you mean, know it clears part, everything up when you have a really good definition doesn't it because anything that you have to decide on you can just go well this either fits the definition or it doesn't and you can just either walk away or throw your whole heart into it right Absolutely. Phil, I need you to come. I got to take a break here. I'm all my, all my, I'm getting goosebumps on my arms here. I don't know whether it's the caffeine or it's talking to Fred. Well, fellas, we could do this for another half hour. Easy. Uh, Fred, you could see we're, we're very grateful for you joining us. We're going to say thank you and let you go. Okay. Fred, uh, in, uh, author of Every Man's Battle series of books, co-author, and his most recent book is Battle on Battle Over. Fred, thanks for hanging out with us. Oh, I've really enjoyed it. And can we do this again soon? Fred, that, we need to because I need to get the book and then I need to go through it. You and I, you and I could really, I think that'd be a really impactful conversation that you and I could have. I agree. What kind of commonalities I, I, are. I'm uh, I'm all over it, Clint. So we'll, we'll get back together soon. We anyway, will. thanks to both of you. Thank you very much. Clint, you know, one of my favorite things about our conversation with uh, Fred was to see you go ahead and take it and run with it. In fact, I think that's one of the things that I'm supposed to do with this is just go ahead and tee it up for you, get some guests in here and let you go. I'm as fascinated hearing you and Fred talk <laughs> as much more so than being a part of it. Well done, Clint. Very well done. I had no idea. You know, you told me to roll with it, my curiosity, and I just that was just authentic and as organic a conversation as you could ever want to have. That was beautiful. And then you, before the uh, we introduced Fred, you talked about fundraising uh, for uh, PW. And, uh, as, as a missionary, I am also a fundraiser because if you're not a fundraiser, you're not a missionary for very <laughs> long. <laughs> and, and I was warned when I took this step and, and I, I just... <laughs> 
the the work I do is so rewarding to minister to men, to be a missionary to men. I, I've been doing it now really for about 20 years, 15 years, week to week, day to day. I really enjoy what I do. But the fundraising has been an education. And I, I'm okay with that because that's part of the responsibility. And Clint, uh, uh, one of the things that we've had to catch up on is I recently led a men's event in, in our area of LA with 25 guys, mostly friends, in the backyard of another friend. And then two days later, I got on a plane, flew to Tulsa, 250 guys from all over the world uh, a large-scale men's ministry event called Summit with Influencers Global Ministries. Uh, again, uh, boy, so rewarding. That's why I love hearing about what you guys, what you and Carla did and what accomplished with the, the event, because it's uh, it's just wonderful to hear. We know the hard work. You and I know the hard work that goes behind these things. It is no uh, easy thing, and that's okay. Uh one of the uh, current uh, phrase, we can do hard things, Clint. We can do hard things. We can and we are. And, you know, for me, I guess I'd like to ask you, so you dealt with, you had how many in the backyard? 20? 25 guys. Uh, we grilled out brats, sausages, hot dogs, and had a massive pot of very hot, spicy chili. We did a guy event. It was wonderful. FCA, for the high school kids, you take pizza. For men, you take chili and you barbecue brats. You know that's really smart. Um, but and then you go to Tulsa for 250 men. And wasn't it amazing that the challenges, the praises, the problems were the same in California as they were in Oklahoma so many times? It, it it's amazing. We had two big events where things just came unglued in the best possible way, with men submitting and saying, "I want more of Jesus." I need more of him with me right now. That's why I came here. And to see guys serve each other, to see guys come along and be true brothers in Christ, uh, very rewarding to me. I, I, you know, people ask, why would you ever be a missionary to men? And the answer is, I saw really bad examples of what it's like to be a guy growing up, my father and another family member. And I saw a really good example of what to be like, my late brother and the kind of man he was. And I, I, I wanted to get in the middle of that, uh, happy to do that. And people say, well, then why or why, you know, what caused you to be I said, pain, <laughs> pain, yeah. what, what got me headed in this direction? Oh, uh, you know, we jokingly can say we get in the middle, but when we, when we found out we were going to be in the middle, but both arms were going to be extended and people were going to be pulling on both of them. That's really when you're in the middle. Uh, amen to that, my brother. Clint, uh, we really we should have Fred back, uh, and again, and he's available anytime. He's read some of what we do. You know, as much as he's had impact and he's had dramatic impact in North American culture at the front line of uh, sex, um, I really enjoyed seeing what you've been able to accomplish on social media over the last two to three months. Keep that up; it's beautiful. Well, thank you. And there's not, you know, I, I get some help. On, on the Instagram and the Facebook, I've reached out to some people that know the landscape better than I do. All the things I do on X, that that's organic, raw, authentic Clint. That's Clint learning. That's Clint growing. That's Clint trying to reach out and encourage. And I'm learning more about what not to do than to do because I can tell you this, for as many conversations that I engage in, I walk away from Three times that. Oh, really? I've never, I've never hit leave the conversation button so many times, mute the conversation, but I finally figured out how to use them. And, and that was an epiphany in and of itself. I mean, I can actually make these people go away. They just, just keep popping up in my thread because somebody tagged me. And sometimes it's humbling and it's honoring to be tagged. And sometimes they're tagging me for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, let's wrap this thing up. What a wonderful opportunity for us to sit down and talk, catching you in the midst of your travels and me after a couple of big events and before a couple more. We're grateful to our uh, guest, uh, Fred Stoker, for hanging out with us. Clint, we'll see you again soon. Thank you, Phil. It is very good to see you. And let's see if we can get back on track with a little more continuity here soon. <laughs>